Hey there, Tolkieners. I'm Danny J. And this is Joel N. And welcome back to Keep on Tolkien. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we want to start off this episode with a bit of an apology. We know that our hiatus was a bit unexpected there. Um, we had some personal issues we had going on in our lives that we had to deal with. And on top of that, we also had kind of exhausted ourselves with uh, how we were running the show. Yeah. Because we were running it more or less the same since we had begun. And uh, as many of you know, we were beginner podcasters. Yeah. And uh, just the amount of time that goes into each episode now is much greater. So it's hard to do a 15 episode run like 15 weeks in a row of, back you know, to back to back yeah to back. so we're gonna restructure a little bit we'll talk more about that with you later though yeah because on top of that uh, like we've previously mentioned uh, he and i we both have full-time jobs yeah it sucks but we just want to reiterate that we do love doing the podcast uh we just had some other responsibilities that came in the way so the part of the restructuring is to kind of avoid from that happening in the future so we can keep doing what we love to do with you guys right and also it'll spread out the seasons over the year so you'll get less time without keep on talking essentially which is cool but uh yeah we're (laughs) we're sorry and uh sorry that got in the way yeah we were gone for a little while but we're back now baby and that's all that matters so one of the things in our personal life that happened during the hiatus was um, two of our very good friends got diagnosed with very serious illnesses. In later last year, 2018, uh, our dear friend Carol, who we call Katie, she has many names, like a Tolkien character, many names. Um, she was diagnosed with several brain tumors, uh, one of which caused her to permanently lo- lose sight in one of her eyes. Um, and right now they think it's most likely caused by an extremely rare genetic disease called NF2. And uh, it causes tumors to grow on nerve tissue. It gets worse. And so a few months later, uh, her boyfriend of four years and uh, my longest and dearest friend I've known for since 1996, uh, he was diagnosed with stage four Hodgkin's lymphoma. But because of Joe's young age, uh, he's only 28 in my age, uh, doctors are confident he can pull through with the help of some pretty intense chemotherapy. And he's uh, currently undergoing that. So at this point, neither Katie or Joe can really work with the the condition or work much with the condition that they have. And they have some pretty intense medical bills ahead of them, as I'm sure some of you can understand. Right. So this brings us to our next point, and that is that we wanted to mention that uh, Katie and Joe, our friends, they do have a GoFundMe page that we are going to link to in the description. And uh, we're hoping that we can help them in some way through this ordeal. If for whatever reason the link doesn't work, uh, if you Google Carol Jean Kistner, GoFundMe, that'll, it's the first result. That's how I found it. <laughs> yeah, and if you want any more details on their story, there'll obviously be more information on the GoFundMe page. And like Danny said, if you just search the name Carol Jean Kistner, uh, she's the first GoFundMe that'll pop up. Otherwise, we'll link it in the description as well. And we know we beg you guys for money all the time already, but if you can find it in your hearts and maybe your pocketbooks to help out in any way, the smallest amount really helps, and we'll consider it a personal favor. So today, this uh, is a special episode uh, dedicated to our dearest friends, and we're calling it Friendship is Magic, a Samwise Gamgee profile. And it's a tale of how friendship can conquer all, and uh, it literally can save the world. Uh, we, and we just wanted to, to end this uh, opening part here with, uh, we wanted to say to Katie and Joe that uh, we love you, and uh, we are here for you. And our gift is our episode, and this one's for you. And you can tell everybody that this is your episode. It might be quite simple, but now that it's done, I hope you don't mind. I hope you don't mind that we put down in words <laughs> how wonderful Samwise Games she is. <laughs> Elton John is great. Now let's start the fucking show. <laughs> and this is an excerpt chosen by Joseph. Here we go. I can't do this, Sam. I know. It's all wrong. By rights, we shouldn't even be here, but we are. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo. The ones that really mattered. Full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't want to know the end. Because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was before so much bad happened? But in the end it's only a passing thing. This shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come. And when the sun rises it will shine out the clearer. Those were the stories that stayed with you. That meant something. Even if you were too small to understand why. But I think Mr. Frodo I do understand. I know now. Folks in those stories had a lot of chances of turning back, only they didn't, because they were holding on to something. What are we holding on to, Sam? That there's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for.
All right, guys. So like we mentioned a little bit ago, today's episode is about the one and only Samwise Gamgee. Samwise Gamgee. Everybody's, he's like everybody's best friend, really. Yeah, he is. Yeah. I think he's a lot of folks' favorite character. Oh, yeah. I yeah, a lot he, of people. He's your t- favorite character, isn't he? He's it? one of my favorite characters. He's probably my favorite character in the Lord of the Rings. Uh, him or Aragorn. I don't know. Okay. But okay. yeah. Um, yeah, he's amazing. He's uh, I, him and Luthien. I would say are the two bravest characters in the Tolkien. I think I can definitely get behind that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they sure. do some pretty crazy things. Just wild shit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nobody else does. So let's just start off with some of the basics. Who is Samwise Gamgee? Well, he's as we know a Hobbit from the Shire. And according to Tolkien himself, he's actually the true hero. Of the Lord of the Rings, god damn it. He's Frodo's loyal gardener and servant. He's a member of the Fellowship of the Ring. He's also one of the bearers of the One Ring. Yeah, for a little bit. We'll get that to later. He's also the mayor of the Shire, eventually, for a long time. And something I actually didn't know previously is that Sam is actually Tolkien's ode to soldiers of World War One who suffered some tremendous hardships and didn't complain about it. Yeah, so uh, Sam is inspired by real... Real ass people. Real soldiers he met. So let's get into the origins of Sam. He was born on April 6th, which is like a couple weeks ago. (laughs) That's pretty close (laughs) to your birthday. Yeah, my birthday, yeah. It's on Thursday. Yeah, his is the 18th. Um, Yeah, but Sam was born on April 6th, and that was in uh, third age 2980, which is 1380 in the Shire Reckoning. I don't understand the Shire Reckoning. Yeah, the the different time. Yeah, it's a totally different calendar. Mm Mm-hmm. So Sam was the youngest son of Hamfast Gamgee and Belle Goodchild. And he was one of six children, and they were all born between the years of 2965 and 2980. And their names are... 83. You forgot about Marigold, dude. Oh. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> no, it's funny because this outline is just like way too detailed. It's got like all these names and like shower, shower reckoning dates, and I was like, let's just tell them the years that it spanned. So, yeah, a little over 20, or a little less than They're having kids for a while. He's part of a big family. They're pumping them out, dude. So his siblings' names, from oldest to youngest, I'll include Sam in here too, just so we get a good picture. It goes Hamson, Halfred, Daisy, May, Sam, and Marigold. Yes, yes. And Sam was born into a a working class Hobbit family. And uh, that's in contrast with uh, Pippin, Frodo, and Mary. They're from the more well-off families they got the money yeah the bagginses and the tooks and the brandy bucks the yeah. brandy bucks have their own like town and hall and yeah everything. they're pretty well off yeah and sam took up his father's trade uh which is gardening when he was a young hobbit and he worked for bilbo maintaining the gardens of bag end yeah so sam is almost as much of a bag end at least sam and, and his and his dad hamfast they're almost as much as part of bag end as oh the yeah. bagginses themselves yeah they come with the house like yeah, if, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and Sam was, uh, he was much, and much like the rest of his family, he grew up to be remarkably simple. Yeah, we're talking just simple in speech, just simple in manner and dress. Uh, but he was also a really cordial and polite person. And Sam is also a romantic, which I love about Sam, because he's just like this regular ass dude, run of the mill kind of dude. Mm-hmm. But when you like sit and listen to him speak, he's amazing. He's got incredible right. insight and he remembers stories. And he's, I think know, that's sort of what's supposed to be special about his character is, yeah, that, yeah. is that he cares. And that's uh, kind of the thing. Uh, Joseph is kind of like that, don't you think? Yeah, like once you get him talking, you're like, wow, this guy is incredibly weird and profound. <laughs> he actually, yeah, he considers things. He cares. Yeah. But otherwise he just kind of sits there and doesn't talk to people. He's shy. But Sam gets his... His, uh, his sort of romantic notions from Bilbo because he hung out around Bilbo often enough and Bilbo's got great stories. Oh yeah. So Bilbo taught Sam how to read. He instilled a love of storytelling and poetry. He taught him about the outside world because as we've talked about previously, the Hobbits and the Shire were pretty uh, close, pretty exclusive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And because he knew that there were great places and things in Middle Earth that Hobbits were just uh, totally, totally ignorant of. Uh, and Sam, uh, he taught Sam about the elves, which he loves. Like, yeah, when Bilbo taught Sam about the elves, that's that was like Sam's obsession. Yeah, and at the beginning of the first book, Sam's like main concern is to meet elves. Yeah, he, yeah, he's completely fascinated by them. But that's about all the information on Sam's early life. The we really get more information about him when it gets 
into down the, into it. Yeah, the early parts of the Fellowship of the Ring where Frodo's about to like set off mm-hmm. on his journey to Rivendell and stuff and stuff. So on the night of April thirteenth, Third Age thirty eighteen. At age 38, Gandalf and Frodo, so same as 38 at this point, uh, Gandalf and Frodo are having a uh, super real down to down to nitty gritty type of conversation in uh, the kitchen. Yeah, they, they're talking about some real serious shit right yeah, now. Yeah, real serious stuff. They're discussing the One Ring, and uh, Gandalf tells Frodo the history and the nature of the One Ring. Yeah, so this is the conversation that happens in, what is it, Shadow of the Past? Yes. Mm-hmm. This is that conversation. This is that conversation. Exposition porn, that chapter. Yeah. And that's when they decide together that the ring cannot stay in the Shire. And this is when good old Sam Gamgee is caught eavesdropping on their conversation out the window. And uh, here's a little excerpt from that. Gandalf crept to one side of the window. Then, with a dart, he sprang to the sill and thrust a long arm, a long arm out and downwards. There was a squawk, and up came Sam Gamgee's curly head, hauled by one ear. Little shit. 38-year-old shit. <laughs> so his punishment for doing this uh, uh, from Gandalf was that he had to accompany Frodo on his journey or or he was going to turn him into a toad or something. Yeah, Sam was terrified of Gandalf. <laughs> so he, he kind of took advantage of that and he's like, you're going to accompany Frodo on this quest. Yeah. But at the same time, he was a little excited about it. Yeah, yeah, of course. And ultimately, Sam is the kind of guy that anyone wants to have on with them when they're going on a quest. Oh, yeah. He's the guy that's obsessed with having all the right supplies that you need. I mean, he's adept at camp making already and starting fires and cooking. And he has really extensive knowledge of the Shire, but just the Shire. Yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> when you're in the Shire, he's, he's real yeah. good with that geography. As long as you're in the Shire, he'll be like, there's a tree 30 clicks up the road, or three clicks up the road that we can sleep under or something. Right, like. but otherwise, outside of the Shire, his geography skills are about as good as mine. They're pretty, <laughs> they're pretty poor. New Zealand is an island, Joel. <laughs> New Zealand is, in fact, an island, guys. Yes. Remember that. Speaking of which, um, we probably should have said something about this sooner, but uh, fuck the, the whole shooting in New Zealand. New Zealand is uh, really important to the, the Tolkien community. Yeah. And uh, we just want to say... Our hearts go out. Our hearts go out, and that's uh, some fucked up shit. We're, Stand strong. Yeah, we're really sorry. Yeah, we're very impressed by your, uh, your government's actions. Yeah, way to go, New Zealand. Fantastic job. Anyways... So the road goes ever on and on, Joel. On September 23rd, 3018, Frodo, Sam, and Pippin, they set out on the road. Yeah, so this is when their plan is to get, basically ultimately get the ring to Rivendell. I right. think right now they're about to make a stop off over in... Um, well, they do all that stuff to like sell his house and then all that like moving out of the Shire stuff. That's yeah, they kind make of a, a stop at Crick Hollow, but there's some time through the Shire. But ultimately, mm-hmm. yeah, this is when they sort of start their journey out to Rivendell. Yeah, end game. Rivendell. They thought that was going to be their the extent of their journey. Yeah, so even right off the bat, Sam already shows his bravery by scouting ahead the company after the the company runs into the Black Riders. Those things are terrifying, but he's like, you know, I'll go check real quick. And they're scared off by the singing of uh, what turned out to be a company of Noldor elves. Yeah, and when Sam realizes that it's elves that scared off the riders, oh, he's so excited. Oh, yeah. And we've got a, a quick <laughs> excerpt about his excitement. <laughs> yeah, I like this one. Elves! exclaimed Sam in a hoarse whisper. Elves, sir! He would have burst out of the trees and dashed off toward the voices had they not pulled him back. (laughs) Oh my god! Elves! That's one thing I love about Sam, too, is despite everything that's going on, yeah, yeah, he still gets pretty excited over stuff. Yeah, he's super ecstatic. Yeah. I think Sam's supposed to be one of those characters that's like us, you know? That's like truly amazed by the this fantasy world that he's being exposed to. to. Yeah. yeah. He's kind of like the reader. So these elves that they come across, they're, as we know, they're led by a, Noldo, uh, a Noldorian elf called Gildor and Glorian. Yeah. And this is when they tell Gildor about the riders, and then Gildor has the company stay with them in a hideout nearby, and then Gildor feeds them, and the elves sing for them, and Sam is just soaking this all up. Oh, yeah. He's just loving it. Here's a little clip it about that. Sam could never describe in words, nor picture clearly to himself, what he felt or thought that night, though it remained in his memory as one of the chief events of his life. Indeed. and uh, Which says a lot. Yeah. Considering everything that's about to happen, this <laughs> yeah, he this... considers one of the chief events of his <laughs> yeah. life. Uh, I bet that changes like daily. No, that was one of the chief events of my <laughs> life. Yeah. 
So ultimately, Gildor advises Frodo not to wait for Gandalf and to fuck off without him. and Because uh, they still had no sign from Gandalf. Yeah, and these riders are a big deal. So he gives them some honest advice after Frodo kind of pries for it. Yeah. He, um, doesn't, he doesn't even want to talk about it. He's like, just no. He, ba- uh, he basically says, yeah, if I told you, you would You'd be too scared. too scared to do anything. Yeah. But ultimately, when the company departs from Gildor and the other elves, Frodo asks Sam his opinion of the elves. And we've got a quick excerpt about Sam's opinion. They seem a bit above my likes and dislikes, so to speak, Sam answered slowly. It don't seem to matter what I think about them. They are quite different from what I expected. So old and so young and so gay and sad, as it were. Yeah, I really like that quote about the owl. Like, so old, so young, so happy, so sad. Yeah, as if he's wrapping his mind around that concept. He's a little confused mm-hmm. by it, but like he sort of he's getting it. Like, could you imagine, like, what is the first thing you'd say to somebody that's 3,000 years old? Right. <laughs> like, like, my life from beginning to end is, like, a week to them. That, yeah. That's... It's ridiculous. I can't imagine. I would love to do it. So let's move on to when... <laughs> so basically, we're going to try to skim out some of the parts of the Lord of the Rings. We're not going to retell the whole damn yeah, thing. Yeah, going forward, because we all know the, the story of Lord of the Rings pretty well. Right. And if you don't, go read the book. It's really good. <laughs> it just so happens. <laughs> So we're going to, yeah, so going forward, we're just going to kind of highlight some of the stuff that pertains to Sam. So let's jump ahead to the chapter, A Conspiracy Unmasked. Yeah, so after the meeting with the elves, uh, the next major thing that happens is the hobbits meet up with Mary after their visit to Farmer Maggots. Mm -hmm. And uh, one night they're having a conversation about the nature of Frodo's departure. And it is actually revealed, and it's pretty funny. I like this conversation. It is revealed that all of Frodo's friends, Pippin, Mary, and Fatty Bulger, they uh known about the ring for years. And yeah, because Frodo's been sitting on this information for a while. Yeah. And they're com- they're basically completely up to date on the nature of the ring in the quest. Yeah, they, they know everything that's been going on. But how do they know? Yeah, but how? Because they have a little spy. A little spy. Who do you think that is? Samwise Gamgee. <laughs> And here's a little snippet about that. Step forward, Sam, said Mary. And Sam stood up with a face scarlet up to the ears. Here's our collector of information. And he's collected a lot, I can tell you, before he was finally caught. After which, I may say, he seemed to regard himself as on parole and dried up. (laughs) He's just like, I'm punishing myself for this. (laughs) Yeah, he seems like the kind of guy, yeah, though kind of torture himself over it yeah i wonder if he's catholic hmm. that's what they taught us hmm. right <laughs> yeah but ultimately this is where the company tells frodo that they're basically coming with him wherever he goes they already know what he's going to tell them and they're already saying no we're going to come anyway so the next major event that happens is they go off to the scary ass old forest yeah and sam isn't super stoked about going to the old forest he's heard some stories but he'll follow frodo no matter what where you lead i will follow Anywhere, Carol King. Good shit. But ultimately, Sam saves Frodo's life for the first time in the Old Forest. Their first real encounter is when they run into Old Man Willow, who tries to drown Frodo in the river, and I think he tries to eat... He's trying to eat Pippin and Mary. Pippin yeah. and Mary, and <laughs> yeah, Sam pulls Frodo out of the river and helps him save Pippin and Mary. Or try. Or try to. <laughs> uh, ultimately, they're saved by, as we know, good old Tom Bombadil. Tom Bombadil. Hey, dilly dub 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 and one of the most important things that Tom does for these guys is this is when Sam gets a strap. You know what I mean? Strap. Slang term for a weapon. This is uh, when the barrel, uh, after the barrel right incident. So I'll be totally honest, that reference, Sam gets a strap, has totally gone over my head till just now when you yeah. explained it. That's why I said that, like, that, that shit from Attack the Block. Kill the snitch. Get the strap. Don't give a fuck. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> God, I love that fucking movie. It's so fucking great. But yeah, after the altercation with the barrel right, Sam and the other hobbits, they arm up, man. Yeah, this is where they get their first swords. They get their uh, Northern Kingdom swords. Yeah, yeah. And they're they're daggers, long knives from the inside of the barrel tombs. Uh, And they have on them the form of serpents in red and gold and leaf-shaped blades. They also had some pretty cool black sheaths that were adorned with red stones. And uh, these blades are referred to as the barrel blades or the daggers of Westerness. Yeah, and those are come into play with uh, the killing of the Witch King. Yeah, yeah, with the killing of the Witch King. Keep that in mind. 
So moving forward in the Lord of the Rings story from here, uh, the next date we want to touch on is September 29th, and that is when the company arrives in Bree, and Sam is very suspicious about everything in Bree. Yeah. It's kind of like when I go to Minneapolis. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Sorry, guys. (laughs) Sorry guys, Chicago beat you in the numbers, so I'm gonna I'm gonna make fun of Ooh. you. Yeah, yeah. For those who don't know, uh, we're from St. Paul, but around here it's the twin cities. There's yeah. Minneapolis and St. Paul, and there's a little bit of a friendly rivalry. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. We there's two cities like on either side of a river, mm-hmm. the river really, the Mississippi. The yeah, and uh, there's a friendly rivalry there. But yeah, there, we we're just we we want to do some Minneapolis outreach because why is Chicago beating us, guys? We're from the Twin Cities. You're right across the river, man. Yeah, we're getting more views from Chicago than Minneapolis is what he means, and uh, yeah. we're concerned about that. So let's change uh, that. Neighbors, come on. Tell if anybody who's listening in Minneapolis, tell five other people in Minneapolis. <laughs> so on September 29th is when the <laughs> this is when the company arrives in Bree, and this is also when the hobbits meet Aragorn, and this is when Aragorn offers to lead them to Rivendell. But Sam remains skeptical and advises Frodo not to trust him. We've got a quick excerpt from this scene here. With your leave, Mr. Frodo, I'd say no. This strider here, he warns us, and he says take care. And I say yes to that, and let's begin with him. Yeah, Sam really only trusts Aragorn after they get Gandalf's letter. Yeah. In Bree, also, Sam meets one of his best friends that happens to be a four-legged creature. Bill the fucking pony. Bill the pony. Yeah, I think this is definitely one a, a major point in Sam's life is when he meets Bill the pony. Oh yeah, Bill the pony's yeah 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 yeah. He's one of his best friends. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the hobbits are ultimately in need of a, a baggage pony to accompany them out on the road, and because of some stuff that happens with the ring wraiths, they kind of fuck up the stables one night, so all the ponies are gone, and the only one that's left is this half-starved pony who's owned by local asshole Bill Fernie. <laughs> local asshole. I love it. Yeah, he, that's really what he is. Like Everyone's like, that asshole, go buy his horse. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and of course he charges way more than the, the damn thing is worth yeah he charges them like four times what a healthy horse would be yeah and this horse th- is about to die yeah. and as the company's i love this one of my favorite sam parts as the company's leaving sam takes an apple out and he chucks it at bill fernie's face and it hits him right in the schnoz <laughs> <laughs> yeah hobbits are supposed to be very good marksmen so that yeah, is they're really good at throwing so things. that's a very accurate scene he also afterwards says that it was regretfully a waste of a good apple <laughs> <laughs> fuck you bill fernie uh, but after the events in Bree, the next major event is probably when Frodo gets knifed on Weathertop. Knifed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> stab, stab. Stab, stab, stab. I like that that robot in Futurama, remember? When <laughs> he has the stabbing robot. <laughs> yeah, I want to practice my stabbing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, great show, guys. So yeah, Sam is understandably upset that his master has been stabbed. By a ringwraith. By a ringwraith, no less. And he's constantly attending Frodo. And this is really when he only fully uh, starts to trust Aragorn. Like, all right, you, you're, you're, you're a G. You're one of us, you know. Yeah, this is when it's like a hundred percent. You're, we're with you. Yeah. Uh, and Frodo later says to, uh, to, to Aragorn that um, he thinks that Sam only trusted him after they met Glorfindel on the road. Because he's like, if Glorfindel's with this dude. Because remember, they find that uh, they run into Glorfindel, and he's like, and then they find the stone. Remember? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So Frodo thinks it's ultimately when they run into Glorfindel that Sam trusts That's Sam, yeah. That's what they okay. later say in a conversation. Yeah. Sam's trust is slow to come by. You got to yeah. earn it. You got to earn that shit. Got to fight off a few ring wraiths and get them to Rivendell before he'll trust you. So let's talk about when they get to Rivendell, man. Sam is constantly at Frodo's side the whole time he's unconscious. Um, and he's out for like quite a while. Yeah, days. he's out for a few days because they get to the ford and then that's when he passes out. But they also, that's what the day that they get to Rivendell too, I'm The same sure. day, yeah, I yeah. think. And yeah. then he's out for a couple days. Because mm-hmm. he bore the wound for what was 14 days, right? 14 days, yeah. man. Yeah, crazy. it was crazy. But he's always holding Frodo's hand. He's commenting on the temperature going from cold to warm as he was getting healed. And uh, yeah, is a little little fun fact here in the uh, Fellowship of the Ring extended edition. There's an interview with Sean Astin, the guy who plays Sam, if you don't know, uh, where he says specifically that Ian McKellen, the guy that you know, plays Gandalf, told him to grab Frodo's hand as soon as he walked in the room, as soon as he you know he wakes up. And then he said that specifically, Ian was like, yeah, fans are going to be looking for that. Like it specifically talks like a whole paragraph about how he's always grabbing his hand. Mm-hmm. So you better do that when you come in, because otherwise the fans will be mad. Ian McKellen knew, and he's like, hey man, make sure you grab his hand. The fans, they're gonna they're gonna look for that accuracy. Yeah, 
And then there's the Council of Elrond. And uh, Sam is not officially invited. No, but he kind of quietly f- follows them yeah. and uh, kind of sits near Frodo on the floor. Yeah. Like, what are you going to do, right? We, you, don't, you don't need a chair? That's fine. Sit on the floor. Yeah. And he has almost, well, pretty much no part in the council at all. He just kind of sits there and is a witness until the very end when uh, it's decided that Frodo's going to take the Ring to Mordor. That's when Sam jumps up and yells at Elrond that they're not going to send him alone. No, indeed, said Elrond, turning toward him with a smile. You at least shall go with him. It is hardly possible to separate you from him, even when he is summoned to his secret council and you are not. I just want to point out one thing here. We're going right back to the text for this. It says here that Elrond did what? He smiled. Specifically, yeah. Smiled. Does Hugo even do that in the film? Mm, I don't even know no. what he looks like when he mm. smiles. I bet it's terrifying. No, I don't think he smiles in that part of the scene. <laughs> no, he, I, actually, I think he, he gets pissed off at this point. Yeah, he it seems like stern. he's mad. Stir. Yeah, Elrond, you know, he smiles sometimes. Yeah, you know, come on, man. Sometimes it happens. What's up, Hugo? What's up, Hugo? We love you. Just, uh, <laughs> we disagree with your... We like your war, Elrond. I like your war, Elrond. But I don't like your lore master, Elrond. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so ultimately, though, Sam is the only person to join the Fellowship during the Council itself, because the Fellowship is formed after the Council, unlike in the movie where it happens, like, right there. Yeah, and then they're all, like, assembled and shit. Sam is actually the only one that joins during the Council. Mm Mm-hmm. So Sam follows the Fellowship on the road south to take the ring to either Gondor or Mordor. They haven't decided. They're not really sure yet. Mm Mm-hmm. But this is what ultimately takes them to the, through the road of Moria. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they try to pass over the mountains. That doesn't work, so they head to the mines of Moria. And this is a sad part for Sam, because he's got to let go of Bill the Pony, because what the fuck is a pony going to do in, in the, the mines. mines of Moria? Right. Yeah, it's pretty emotional. He's got to turn away his good friend. Mm-hmm. Sam actually kills his first orc in the battle of the Chamber of Marazabul. Yeah! That's what Ma- it, Maz- Mazarbul. Mazarbul, excuse me. Mazarbul. Chamber of Mazabul. Mazabul. And uh, he's actually wounded, too. He's got a, ga- a big gash on his head. Uh, he's bleeding pretty good. Luckily, they got Aragorn with him, though, who can pretty much treat most things. Yeah, he Aragorn, tends to, yeah. Aragorn tends his wound. Yeah, as soon as they get out of Mines of Moria, pretty much. Next leg of the journey leads us to the woods of Lothlorien, where Sam meets Galadriel, and he blushes at her gaze when he sees her. Yeah, he said that it felt like he was completely bare before her and he he really didn't like the feeling it's like your psychiatrist (laughs) (laughs) i feel so bare in front of you sam and frodo uh they also get to gaze into the mirror of galadriel yeah and they're pretty disturbed by what they see uh so sam gets to look in first and he sees he sees a couple different things the mirror kind of gives you multiple images can show you past present future yeah and then she's kind of like i don't even know which is which i don't don't, don't know (laughs) But ultimately, so Sam, when he looks in, he first sees uh, Frodo's face under a cliff, and it's pale, as if he's fast asleep. Then he also sees himself climbing a winding stair and running alone, seeking something urgently in the dark. And then the vision shifts, and he sees the felling of many trees. And he t- he sees uh, Ted Sandyman, that douchebag he, that runs the mill that he really doesn't like. He sees him cutting down the great tree on the road to Bywater. Back in the Shire. Yeah, he sees the old mill has disappeared and has been replaced by a large, nasty-looking brick buildings, and many hobbits are working at building some other nasty brick buildings, and he's just seeing some real nasty stuff. There's a large red chimney nearby with smoke that fogs the mirror completely. And finally, the worst of all, he sees Bagshot Row completely dug up in all dirt, and he sees his old, his dear old gaffer going down the road with an empty wheelbarrow. Yeah, the vision is ultimately too much for sam and he pulls himself away and he's just weeping and he says he wants to go home but this is when galadriel warns him that the mirror is dangerous quote is a dangerous guide to deeds yeah so you don't want to like really act on anything you see in the mirror essentially because you don't know what you're seeing really you have no context for it so it's a dangerous guide to what you're going to do. Yeah, she says things have not happened yet. You know, things have not come to be and may never come to be. You're not too sure. So it's a real crapshoot. Yeah. So in that moment, Sam makes one of many difficult choices that he must face. And he chooses to stay his course with Frodo and to not return to the Shire. And we've got a quick excerpt about that. Sam sat on the ground and put his head in his hands. I wish I had never come here. And I don't want to see no more elf magic, he said and fell silent. After a moment, he spoke again thickly, as if struggling with tears. No, I'll go home by the long road with Mr. Frodo. 
or not at all, he said. But I hope I do get back someday. If what I've seen turns out to be true, someone's going to catch it hot. Yeah, I love that. Someone's going to catch it hot. Sam's going to fuck you up. So, in Lothlorien, they are given the gifts of the lady. And, uh, yeah, before they do fellowship, uh, Frodo gets the star glass, Aragorn gets the elf stone, and the sheath of Andriel, Lo- Legolas gets the bow of Galathrim, Gimli gets three strands of hairs, weird, but all right, <laughs> Pippin and Mary <laughs> get the Noldor daggers, uh, Boromir gets the belt of gold, and Sam gets a small wooden box. Inside is the dirt of the gardens of Lothlorien. And what else, Joel? A single Malorn seed. Yeah. The Malorn is uh, those special trees that grow in Lothlorien. I don't think they grow anywhere else, do they? No, they don't. Yeah, it's the only place in Middle Earth that they, they grow. Yeah, they grow particularly tall. And don't they have like white bark or they, something? They like, live like? in them. Yeah, and they like, yeah, they like have white bark and they like live in them and shit. It's great. They're really beautiful trees. But uh, it's a big, it's a significant move because I don't think anyone up until this point had really like gifted anyone the Malorn tree to plant. No, yeah. It was kind of something that they kept exclusive to their woods. Yeah. So it's a pretty nice gift for a gardener. Yeah. And they actually don't, um, I should have put this here, I don't know why, but they uh, didn't know it was a Malorn seed. He thought it was, he thought it was a seed of something. Oh, Sam didn't know it was a Malorn seed. But he did, he finds out in the end how it's a Malorn tree. uh, because that's the tree that ultimately replaces the party tree, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Oh, boy. Jumping way too far ahead. We'll get to that. Let's talk about the breaking of the Fellowship. So this is down by the Falls of Raros, you know, you guys know. And uh, this is where Boromir tries to take the ring from Frodo, which causes Frodo to leave the Fellowship. Helps Frodo finally make that hard decision. And when the company realizes that Frodo has gone missing, this is when they lose their fucking shit. Yeah. Everyone starts running around <laughs> calling out for Frodo. <laughs> Sam initially follows Aragorn... But then he stops, and he thinks better of it, and he realizes that Frodo's leaving would most likely want to cross the river. Mm -hmm. So this is when Sam makes a beeline back for those boats. And of course, Sam finds an invisible Frodo, or an empty boat, (laughs) trying to leave across the river. So he uh, tries to do something that he doesn't know how to do, and he tries to swim out there to Frodo, but he nearly drowns. But ultimately, Frodo saves him, because Frodo's not going to watch Sam drown. Like. He's going to watch his, one of his best friends drown. And once he gets on the boat, that's when Sam once again renews his promise and leaves the fellowship behind with Frodo. Real inspiring moment. Yeah. And then we come to the Gollum days. Yeah, the next major event after they split off from the Fellowship is basically when they meet up with Gollum. And yeah, they go to the Emin Wheel, and they get lost in the maze of rocks. And they can see Mordor from afar. And this is a little quote about Sam's frustration. What a fix, said Sam. That's the one place in all the lands we've ever heard of that we don't want to see any closer. And that's the one place we're trying to get to. And that's just where we can't get know-how. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I love that too. I love that they kept that in the movie. Do you think that's most of the, like, a lot of... I feel like Sam has a higher percentage of lines that made it to the movie than a lot of other characters. Do you feel that way? I'd have to go through the movies again, but off the top of my head, I think you're right because yeah, I know I he's got he's got right. a he's got a handful of lines that are actually his, and like some people's like Gandalfs and tree beards, they get they like traded. Him, yeah. yeah, no, yeah. Sam's Sam had a good amount of his lines come through that he actually got to say himself. Mm-hmm. That's a very astute observation. Thank you. I studied Sam for a while writing this episode. <laughs> so uh, during the night in uh, one night in Emin Wheel, that sounds like a porno. One night in M and Wheel. More one night in M and Wheel. <laughs> but like we said, this is when they get ambushed by Gollum. And uh, so Gollum ends up trying to strangle Sam and Frodo pulls Sting on Gollum, as we know. And, you know, this Shushing. subdues him and eventually Gollum chills the fuck out. And they work out some kind of arrangement. And this is when Gollum claims he can take them to the Black Gate. Yeah, and he ultimately, uh, Frodo makes him like swear an oath on the ring that he'll take them to the right place. But he'll actually do it. Yeah, uh, and Frodo agrees to let Gollum be their guide. And he figures that the one ring will keep his promise. Yeah, he knows that the one thing is really, or excuse me, the one ring is the only thing that, that Gollum he cares about. really cares about. Yeah. So it's really the only thing that he can make Gollum swear on. Mm-hmm. It's mostly, like, it's kind of like when they say swear on your mother's grave, because like everybody's supposed to yeah, like their mom. everyone's supposed to love their mom. <laughs> Yeah, but ultimately Sam never fully trusts Gollum. He didn't want him as a guide from the start. He didn't he wasn't really on board with that, but he he follows Frodo. And he names Gollum's two different personalities, Slinker and Stinker. Because as we know, Gollum's a little bipolar. Yeah. Well, well not even bipolar, he's no, like split, uh, split person. Per- yeah, split, split personality. Yeah. He's totally split me. personality. And they, when they talk to each other, it's super funny. <laughs> 
So yeah, the two personalities, Slinker and Stinker, one day when they're going through the dead marshes, Sam overhears them talking about some sort of plan that they had. Sam assumes it's about to try to get the ring. Yeah, but then he kind of dozes back off and just kind of brushes it aside. Maybe not a good idea. But yeah, ultimately, Gollum is true to his word and does take them to the Black Gate. But while they're kind of assessing the situation there, they decide it is completely fucking impossible to try to get in through the Black Gate. That's like the front door. Yeah, I don't know why they ever thought that was the plan. Like Maybe it's just because that's the, where they knew they where would be, in. I guess. I love how in the movie they get to the point where they're about to run. They're, <laughs> like, <laughs> they're like, I one, guess we'll... One, two, three, go! <laughs> Gollum's like, no! Yeah, like, that's a stupid idea. Yeah, so Gollum ultimately stops them as well, and he tells them that he knows another more secret way to get into Mordor. Yeah. Up the stairs and then a tunnel. A tunnel. And Frodo agrees and lets Gollum be their guide once again. And after much traveling, this is when they ultimately make their way into Ithilien. Yeah, yeah. This is when they run into some ranger danger. Ranger danger. <laughs> <laughs> one day while camped in Ithilien, Frodo and Sam are caught in the middle of a skirmish between the rangers of Ithilien and the men of Harad. And this is the first time that uh, Sam and Frodo see warfare between men, you know, man on man killing each other. And it's pretty intense for them. Yeah, and they don't really like it at all. <laughs> and uh, Sam says a quote that uh, they gave to Faramir in the movie. I'm glad it made, uh, it well, it was an extended cut, but they, mm-hmm. they made it into the movie as a Faramir quote. But uh, this is it right here. Here we go. It was Sam's first view of battle, men against men, and he did not like it much. He was glad he could not see the dead face. He wondered what the man's name was, and where he came from, and if he was really evil at heart, or what lies and threats had led him on the long march from his home, and if he would not rather have stayed there in peace. That's one of those lines to me, like, that's some, like, all quiet on the Western Front shit. Yeah, Me, me and Joel are up. both big fans of uh, that film and the and the uh, the book, it's mm-hmm. been, and that's uh, w- really the only experience of World War One that I no, because I read that book. And it's terribly dark and terribly yeah. depressing. But uh, it's uh, it's kind of like, you know, like we're fighting these people. Like, how do we know that they're truly evil? You know? Right. And they're not just people like us. They're yeah, not just people like us that are doing what they're told. <laughs> yeah. It's very sad. War sucks, guys. Mm, War is a terrible thing, as Tolkien points out. But ultimately, Sam and Frodo are taken captive by Faramir. Oh, and then this is when it gets really, really good. Yeah, this is when he leads him over to Askeliath. And there's like super cool battles with orcs. And the Nazgul show up. And then Frodo like almost gives him the ring. And then he's pulled away by Sam and they fall down and it's super dramatic. Oh, it's all so sick, you guys. JK. JK, that was some shit that they added to the movie. Hell no. Sorry, that didn't happen. They don't go to Askeliath. They do. Yeah, they do. Well, we'll see. But they don't go to Askeliath at this point in the story. <laughs> Yeah, if you don't know, we hate that Osculeth scene. Yeah, a lot Very of people unnecessary. don't like that scene. So what really happens, Faramir leads them to the super cool ranger's hideout called Haneth Anun. Did I say that right? Yes, you did. The window on the west. And it's like a, a secret cave fortress it sounds super behind cool. a waterfall. Yeah. It's a really cool place. Yeah, and they have to black bag them to bring them there. They're mm. like, nobody's about to learn where this shit is. Uh, yeah, and uh, Sam initially doesn't trust Faramir. Big surprise. Yeah. Um, until they lo- they talk and learn a little bit more, they learn that Faramir's Boromir's brother. And Faramir guesses that they're carrying the ring. And he also tells them that Boromir's dead. They don't know that he's dead yet. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, they're pretty scared that Faramir is going to try to take the ring from them for a minute. But uh, this is when Frodo gets a, good li- get, gets a good glimpse at the difference between Faramir and Boromir. Mm-hmm. And there's some really great dialogue here, and like maybe we'll, I don't know, maybe there will be a Feanor episode or a fucking Faramir episode. Yeah, I don't know, maybe we could talk about these guys in future episodes or something. Maybe, Hmm. maybe. Hmm. Strange. Hmm. Hmm. A regular show. Hmm. 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 (laughs) But this is when we find out that Faramir ultimately wants nothing to do with the ring. In fact, he is actually willing to help them with their task. Yeah. Faramir doesn't take them to Osculeth at all. He just gives no. them food and walking <laughs> no, sticks and sends them on their way. And he's like, we're done with this. I guess they're trying to humanize him a little bit in the movie and well, yeah, make I, him show that he's susceptible to temptation, I, I guess. I think it's, but if I know anything about screenwriting, it was because they didn't want to do Shelob in the second movie like it was in the book. So they had to add a bunch of shit oh. to extend it to the uh, to where they're just leaving to go to Shelob. That's my Personal theory. Okay, sure. Whatever. Changed my mind. All right. No, no, you good. You good. <laughs> so the next major point in Sam's story is when we get uh, Samwise the Stairmaster here. They get to, <laughs> 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 
they make their way to the Morkel Fail, and this is when they get to the stairs of Kirithungal. And on the way up of the stairs, dude, some super crazy shit happens. Yeah, Gollum throws away, like, the rest of their Lambeth bread. And super, uh, Frodo gets, like, super fucking pissed. Yeah, Gollum, like, lies and tries to tell him that Sam did it. And then Sam was like, no, it wasn't me. And then Frodo's like, oh, yeah, you did it. You should, sh- I shouldn't trust you. No, I trust Gollum more. Fuck you. Go home, Sam. And then Sam is like, oh, no. Just kidding, that shit doesn't happen either. Oh, hell no. No, that really bothers me about the movie, too. I don't like that. <laughs> if, you, if you didn't catch it, that, that's, that whole bit really bothers us, too. <laughs> the whole, like, pitting Sam against Frodo and throwing so, away the Lambeth bread. And like, they, they never, their friendship never wavered at any point in no. the story. Like, and they just added that as, like, drama. And, like, Frodo never trusted Gollum that much. Like, you know, anyway. Yeah, in all serious no, seriousness, though, uh, Sam and Frodo, they make... <laughs> They make their, <laughs> but seriously. But seriously. They make their way up the staircase, and then they find themselves staring down a long, dark tunnel. And uh, they go down the tunnel, and it's too dark for them to see anything. Yeah, and uh, Gollum disappears. Big surprise. And he leaves the hol- hobbits on their own. And uh, Frodo has to use the file of Galadriel, and when they light it up, they see hundreds of eyes staring at them in the darkness. And throughout the coming skirmish, Frodo and Sam are separated. Sam is ambushed by Gollum. Sam actually hits Gollum so hard with the the walking stick that Faramir gave him that it breaks in two. Yeah, and th- yeah that, that really gets Gollum to fuck off for a little bit. Yeah, and when Sam emerges, he sees Frodo lying on the ground, pale-faced and covered in webs. Yeah, and this is when Sam kind of loses it. Sam takes Sting in the vial of Galadriel, and he charges Shelob. Bloodlust, plus five attack bonus. Hell yeah. He's in rage mode. And he stabs out one of her eyes, and then the fight ultimately stabs with Sam forcing Shelob to impale herself on the sword. And that's when she just kind of fucks off back into her cave. Yeah. Trailing a dark slime trail of filth. It's Blood. gross. Yeah, she's she's nasty. And this is what comes, uh, now we come to the chapter that is the most Sam-heavy chapter. Because he's the only goddamn character in it, <laughs> essentially. Um, the choices of Master Samwise. Yeah, this is a really great chapter. So this is when Sam comes down by Frodo's side. He sees Frodo is pale, and uh, he realizes that that's what he saw in the mirror of Galadriel. Only Frodo isn't sleeping. He realizes that Frodo is dead. With Frodo dead, presumably, Sam makes a hard decision. He takes the ring from Frodo. He feels the great burden on him as he puts the ring on around his neck. Just instantly, he feels the weight of the ring. Yeah. Because, like, he's heard Frodo talk about it, and he's seen the effect on him, but mm-hmm. now he feels it. Yeah, for realsies this time. He also takes Sting and the file of Galadriel. They're very, they're going to be very useful tools where he's going. Yes. <laughs> he lays down his own sword at Frodo's side, and uh, he leaves. But before he does, he says some really sad shit, and we're about to quote it. Goodbye, master, my dear, he murmured. Forgive your Sam. He'll come back to the spot when the job's done, if he manages it. And he'll not leave you again. Rest you quiet until I come. And may no foul creature come anigh you. And if only the lady could hear me and give me one wish, I would wish to come back here and find you again. Goodbye. Yikes. <laughs> yeah, that's really sad. Yeah, the whole part when Sam is talking to the dead corpse of Frodo, it's like, it, it wrecks me every fucking time. Yeah, yeah, it definitely tears you apart on the, on the inside. So as Sam is leaving Frodo's body, he hears voices. And he knows orcs are approaching. They're just around the corner. So Sam puts on the ring. And he notices that his vision is dimmed, but his hearing is sharpened. And he also, if he can, if he tries, he can understand the orc language while he's wearing the ring. Yeah, he's starting to realize these crazy abilities that the ring gives yeah. him. Yeah, and it's like, is this like, it's just growing power as you get closer to... Yeah, yeah. as he goes into more of it, just gets stronger. So the orcs are called Shagrat and Gorbag, two of my favorite characters. <laughs> I love all the named orcs in The Lord of the Rings. So they talk about how a powerful warrior, most likely some kind of warrior elf, is on the loose. And they figure somebody had to be pretty badass to cut through uh, Shelob's webs and, and make her fuck off. Yeah, and then ultimately uh, wound her. Because they even say, like, look at that trail of slime that she left yeah. behind. And uh, they take away Frodo while uh, ultimately talking about how Shelob only eats living flesh and that Frodo's not dead. He only goes limp as a bone fish. <laughs> <laughs> That's how she likes him. Fresh blood. <laughs> We've seen the movie way too many times, Joel. 
we're gonna like cut to like 50 years from now us sitting in a padded room just reciting lines reciting back, lines to, from back and forth each other yeah. literally when we just get down to nothing to do we'll just sit down together and recite lines back and forth yeah why not <laughs> this is our lives <laughs> I like, yeah, I love how they're like, there's a powerful elvish warrior on the loose. And they even say he's got a, a an elven blade and an axe. Like, what the fuck? How do you know that? These orcs are so stupid. I hate, I, I hate, the orc characters are hilarious. I, I love them to death. <laughs> but ultimately, the orcs take Frodo up to, and all his possessions, up to the tower nearby. In the last line of the two towers, I love this shit, because Tolkien just is so good at cliffhangers. Um, The last line of the book, the two towers, was, Frodo was alive, but taken by the enemy. Bum, bum, bum. Major cliffhanger. And then we go down. Sam goes down to have some fun at Kirithungul. Fun times at Kirithungul. Sounds like a good 80s movie about Kirithungul. <laughs> An 80s teen comedy set in the tower of Kirithungul. I'd watch that shit. <laughs> so ultimately, Sam tries to follow those same orcs uh, back to the tower, but he gets separated from the company. And he plans to sneak back into the tower, no matter what the peril, just so that he can rescue Mr. Frodo. And Sam bears the ring up over the pass and finally down into Mordor. And he decides that it's too dangerous to use in Mordor. And he's like, yeah, I'm not going to do that again. He notes that he can feel its power growing and the burden grows heavier. Yeah, and this is when he has that crazy moment, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And this is when he basically decides it's too powerful here and he vows not to use it again. Mm Mm-hmm. But then, it's just as Sam's coming over the pass, and he looks down, the pass of Kirithungul, he looks down on Mordor, and he sees all of it in its disgusting glory. And uh, this is when he's first tempted by the ring. Super hard. Sam sees in his mind what would be what it would be like if he claimed the ring for his own and used it to throw down Sauron. Yeah. And we've got a quick excerpt here about that. I love this one. So awesome. Already the ring tempted him, gnawing at his will and reason. Wild fantasies arose in his mind, and he saw Samwise the Strong, hero of the age, striding with a flaming sword across the darkened land, and armies flocking to his call as he marched to the overthrow of Barad-dûr. And the white sun shone, and at his command the Vale of Gorgoroth became a garden of flowers and trees, and brought forth fruit. He only had to put on the ring and claim it for his own, and all this could be. That is very tempting, like, for Sam, just to, like, I love how they, he even, like, Sauron went after his love of flowers and stuff. Yeah, that's how twisted he is. He's like, he'll twist anything. He's like, if you, even if you love good things. Yeah, we'll twist that into you doing some evil shit to try to get that, and then you probably won't even get it in the end. Right, exactly. <laughs> Ultimately, Mordor is probably still going to look like Mordor. <laughs> yeah. Sam is uh, ultimately able to shake off this idea, which is like crazy to me. Like, oh yeah, this yeah. is that big moment I was thinking about. Yeah, and uh, he uh, his humility comes into play, and he just yeah he's like no, like I I'm Sam, I'm gonna do my thing, and I'm gonna help Frodo and destroy the ring. That's what yeah. I set out to we do. We have a quick excerpt actually about that moment. The one small garden of a free gardener was all his need and do. Not a garden swollen to a realm, his own hands to use, not the hands of others to command. Humility. Humility. Which we talk about often is uh, probably one of the, when you, you take like Tolkien character qualities, mm-hmm. humility is, it's praised. Yeah. He, above uh, pride. Yeah. He often, yeah, he often uses pride in a negative light in con, you know, compared to humility. Mm-hmm. We talked about that a little bit with uh, Elendil versus like Feanor. We were talking like yeah, yeah, two yeah. different kind of characters. There. Exactly. So Sam makes his way down to the Tower of Kirithungul and he's blocked at the entrance by uh, some dark magic emanating from two hideous statues, which are called the Watchers. I love the Watchers and I was kind of sad that that moment kind of got left out. They gave you yeah. the shots of them, but nothing really happened. Yeah, nothing like what's about to happen. <laughs> so ultimately the Watchers actually keep Sam from being able to move forward. They stop him. There's some kind of a barrier there. Mm-hmm. And Sam uses the light of the file of Galadriel to break the spell and pass through. Yeah, yeah. But as he does, he kind of feels like the dark barrier like close behind him mm-hmm. and they make a hideous screech. Yeah, he like sets off an alarm basically. Mm-hmm. The watchers yeah. screech out and <laughs> the... I think he actually says at one point too, uh, I've gone and rung the front doorbell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Sam prepares for a fight, but when he gets inside the tower, he finds that the place is already trashed. Yeah, it's totally destroyed. There's blood and bodies and severed limbs everywhere. And uh, it seems that all the orcs had killed each other. 
for some reason. <laughs> Convenient. And Sam notes he feels like there's nobody left alive in the tower, which makes him like, he's like, nobody, nobody, including Frodo. Like, so he kind of freaks out. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the, he starts making his way up towards the top of the tower, and he runs into an orc that runs from sight of the elven blade sting. And Sam, like, he's like, oh, this guy's going to run back to wherever, you know, so I'll follow him. I got nothing else to, I got no leads, let's follow him. Yeah, let's see where this guy goes. Maybe he'll take him back to Frodo. And this whole time he's frantically looking for Frodo, and he starts to get really uh, panicked, and he can't find him. Um, so he kind of starts to sing some songs uh, from the Shire, and some of the Bilbo songs come up. And uh, as he's singing them, you can hear, he thinks he hears somebody like respond, but then it's muffled by an orc voice and the crack of a whip. Yeah, he hears that orc. Yeah, and that's, uh, Sam is like, as he's singing, is still following the orc. And the orc is too afraid to notice that he's, uh, that this dude is singing. Yeah, but this is when he sees a trap door open in the ceiling and a ladder come down. And he this is why he was so confused. He couldn't find the room where he thought Frodo was. Yeah, because he heard them saying that they were going to take him to the top of the tower. And he's like, well, I'm as high as the stairs go. Where? Where is it? Where is it? Turns out there was this secret door in the ceiling and a ladder. And Sam hears the small orc, who is named Snaga. <laughs> He tells Shagrat, who we've met before, that the elven warrior is back, or is arrived. And he orders Snaga back downstairs, and Snaga tells him to fuck himself. He blames him ultimately for Gorbag, Gorbag and Shagrat for starting the fight, over which turned out to be Frodo's mithril coat. Yeah, it turns out this whole fight that killed all the orcs <laughs> that started amongst themselves started with the, one of these guys, and it was over Frodo's mithril coat. Because, I mean, that mithril coat was super expensive. Yeah. Do you think orcs even know what it's worth, though? I think they're like, it's shiny. Well, I mean, I'm sure they have some concept. Like, I mean, shit. <laughs> Either way, that was good luck for them because they said the Mithril coat was worth more than the Shire, right? Yeah, yeah. And everything in it. And everything in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that Mithril coat was fucking crazy. But uh, basically... Yeah, they have a little... Snega and uh, uh, Shagrat have a little fight and Snega's wounded and he fucks off. But then Sam is like, this is my time. Yeah, Sam takes advantage of the moment and Sam goes up the ladder and confronts, sh- confronts Shagrat. And we've got an excerpt about that. Yeah, yeah. He sprang out to meet Shagrat with a shout. He was no longer holding the ring, but it was there, a hidden power, a cowing menace to the slaves of Mordor. And in his hand was Sting, and the light smote the eyes of the orc like the glitter of cruel stars in the terrible elf countries, the dream of which was a cold fear to all his kind. Yeah. That's pretty badass. And after, uh, yeah, Shagrat is, they have a little bit of scuffle, Shagrat grabs a black bundle, and he falls down the, uh, he struggles with Sam and then he falls down the, the uh, whatchamacallit? The trap door. The trap door. So Sam is finally uh, able to attend to Frodo, who's been lying on the floor naked this whole time. Yeah, he finally finds Frodo alive. But it turns out that Frodo's been whipped and tormented and stripped of all his clothes. Everything. Everything. And uh, yeah, as Frodo comes to realize that they took everything, he starts losing his shit. He thinks that they have the ring and that the quest is lost. He starts freaking out about it. I love that quote where he's like, we can hide from the shadow. Uh, Even the elves can leave, but who knows if the sea is wide enough to block the shadow and like all this. Yeah, he's losing his shit. He's like, it's the whole world is going to end. There's nothing we can do, even in a best case scenario. But that's when Sam tells Frodo that he has the ring. You know, calm down just a second. At first, Frodo is astonished and grateful but then he goes all fiendish and demands the ring back. And Sam does hesitate for a moment, but it's not out of the greed, like the lust for the ring. It's because he's like, dude, do I even want to give this back to him? Because like, of what it does. Because what it, what it does and like it hurts, like it physically hurts to carry the damn thing. Yeah, he hesitates out of love for Frodo. He doesn't want to give him this horrible burden. But he does give it back just to be called a thief by a fiend in Frodo. Yeah, Frodo straight up calls him a thief. That's got to hurt. Yeah. Sam uh, starts to weep. And then Frodo kind of like, whoa. He kind of comes up, comes to and he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. Didn't mean to say that. You're pretty awesome. I am really sorry. He thanks Sam for everything because Sam's done a lot Yeah, for him. And he tells him that uh, it's ultimately Frodo's burden to bear. And Sam can help, but he can't physically carry the ring. And right about this time, they decide to get, it's, uh, get the fuck out of Dodge. So they gather some orc supplies. And they hit the road dressed as orcs. And then begins their mount, their journey to Mount Doom. Mm-hmm. Finally. Not a whole lot happens in the story between uh, Kirithungul and Mount Doom. It's a lot of dialogue between Frodo and them sitting hungry and thirsty. Yeah, it's it's just a little more torture for them. Yeah, it's it just sucks. unpleasant. They time. dodge some orcs and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Frodo gets even more and more frail and fucked up. Mm-hmm. Sam continues to take care of him. 
Yeah, and they're struggling from lack of food and water, and uh, Sam, more or less, at this point, accepts that they are going to die in Mordor, even if they complete their task, because they have no food and no water. But all the same, Sam intends to do just that. Yeah, he says if that's what's got to happen. If he's going to die either way, he's going to make sure that he gets it done first. Mm -hmm. So by the time Sam and Frodo reach the slopes of Mount Doom, Frodo is pretty fucked up. Like, he can barely stand. Yeah. And he's damn near crazy. Like, he's, he's Losing not it. there. Yeah, yeah, he's not there. And uh, he actually starts to crawl up the hill on his hands and knees because he can't walk. He's so frail at this point. And, uh, yeah, Sam decides to do the Sam thing. And he picks up Car- uh, Frodo and carries him the rest of the way. And we got a really cool quote about that. Sam looked at him and wept in his heart. But no tears came to his dry and stinging eyes. I said I'd carry him if it broke my back, he muttered. And I will. Come, Mr. Frodo, he cried. I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you and it as well. So up you get. Come on, Mr. Frodo, dear. Sam will give you a ride. Just tell him where to go and he'll go. Yeah, it's one of my favorite. Dude, in the movie when that like the, the music builds up, he's like, I can't carry it for you, but I gotta carry you. Yeah, they simplify and they just cut it off at I can carry you and it's super yeah. dramatic. And super effective. Picks yeah. up and, you know, the orchestra picks up and yeah. it's super cool. God, look at all those Oscars. They deserved it. Yeah, they deserve that shit. So Sam and Frodo now start the last leg of the journey. The last, last leg. Yeah, of the journey. they're going up the mountain. Yeah, and they're going into Samoth Nower, which is uh, as they're about to do that, all hell breaks loose. Yeah, this is when they're attacked by Gollum. And uh, there's a scuffle there. Sam tells Frodo just to go on ahead and continuing up the mountain. And Sam draws Sting and he turns to deal with Gollum once and for all. Yeah, this there's a lot that's been leading up to this moment yeah. for Sam. And Gollum actually doesn't even look for a fight, but as soon as he draws the sword, he pleads for mercy. Yeah, he sees like Sam is ready. He's like, this yeah. is it, man. I'm going to fucking kill you. Murder in the eyes, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah and Gollum just kind of cowers down. And Sam once again spares his life, and Gollum flees down the mountain. And when Sam catches up with Frodo, he's already standing in the Chambers of Fire in Mount Doom. Then Sam calls out to Frodo, who's standing there motionless. And then Frodo does the unthinkable. And we have an excerpt about this moment. Then Frodo stirred and spoke in a clear voice, indeed with a voice clearer and more powerful than Sam had ever heard him use. And it rose above the throb and the turmoil of Mount Doom, ringing in the roof and walls. I have come, he said, but I do not choose now to do what I came to do. I will not do this deed. The ring is mine. And suddenly he set it on his finger and he vanished from Sam's sight. Boom. Yeah, this is some crazy last second shit to deal with. And we want to just reiterate here, we've started this before... Frodo failed. Yeah. Hashtag Frodo Hashtag failed. Hashtag Frodo failed. And it's okay. Because the task, you know. Was impossible, more or less. Yeah. For and one he, person. And I just like, because I, at the trivia night we did, we, uh, one of the, our trivia questions was who destroyed the ring? And a lot of people said Frodo. Yeah. We thought that'd be a fun trick question. Because yeah. I mean, when, when you think of Lord of the Rings, like, oh yeah, it's when Frodo, you know, destroys the ring. Yeah. Like Mountain Doom. And you, then you think about it and you're like, no. But that's not true. Frodo, even our, even our esteemed hero throughout the whole movie or the, the movie slash book it's both mm-hmm. he uh, he can't do it he gets all the way to the very very end the very end and he's standing over the crack of doom and he doesn't do it mm-hmm. and sam is standing there the whole time understandably fucking horrified and uh, he really has no time to react because in that moment he's sucker punched from behind by guess who Gollum, and he falls and hits his head hard and starts bleeding and uh he watches the invisible frodo and Gollum have it out yeah, this is when Gollum bites off Frodo's ring finger and takes the ring for himself. And Gollum is so ecstatic that he falls right into the crack of doom and into the fires, completely on accident. Finally, destroying the ring for good. Yay! So we see Smeagol is the <laughs> ultimate hero of this story. <laughs> I listened to the audiobook when I was working on this episode, and that Robert Inglis, like, when he falls, he's like, Pressure! Pressure! He's great. He's a treasure. So with zero time to lose, Frodo and Sam, they book it out the doorway and down the slope of the mountain. Fire and lava and all kinds of fumes and smoke and yeah. ash are shooting out. Now volcanoes. everything's erupting. Yeah, volcanoes. Yeah. Volcanoes, guys. Because volcanoes. Because volcanoes. So ultimately, they make it to a somewhat safe spot 
on the slopes, and they have a brief conversation about Gandalf being right about Gollum playing some part in their tale before the end. Yeah, and Frodo says that we should forgive Gollum, because even for all his treachery, if he, it was, he did help them quite yeah, a bit. He and did. he did ultimately do what Frodo could not. He led them there, more or less, and then he's ultimately the one that uh, got the ring into the crack of doom. Mm-hmm. Then Frodo says uh, what's one of my favorite lines in all of uh, um, Lord of the Rings, and that's coming up. For the quest is achieved, and now all is over, and I am glad you are here with me, here at the end of all things, Sam. Pause for tears. Oh, God, that moment. The moment where they accept their death. Mm Mm-hmm. It's awful. Yeah, and this part, and uh, what I love what they did in the movie is they did that black screen. Yeah, and you think it's the end? In the in the book, it shifts back from when he says that I'm here at the all end of all things, Sam. It shifts back to the broken fellowship. So you don't know if they're gonna die or not. And then mm-hmm. Gandalf is like, "Let's Eagles, let's go, let's go now." Yeah, the way that Tolkien splits up the storytelling is makes like, it so dramatic. It's perfect. Yeah, the way that he splits that up, not letting you know what happens at certain points. Yeah, it's really great. It's awesome. So the eagles are coming. The S- eagles. Sam and Frodo are ultimately saved by Gandalf and the eagles of Manway. And Gandalf, he rode upon Gwaihir, the lord of eagles. Sam and Frodo were born by Lantreval, brother to Gwaihir, and Meneldor the Swift. Yeah, yeah. So let's get into some post-war stuff. That's always the fun part, right? Yeah, the, the, war is the over. result after the war. War is over <laughs> Yep. So war's over. <laughs> um, Sam and Frodo, they're they're unconscious. Like they they're starved to death. They they don't know what the hell happens. So they wake up in a huge bed together in a huge bed. But then Sam recognizes the sweet fragrance of Ithilien. Ithilien has uh, a pretty good fragrance. There's a lot of wonderful plant life there. Yeah, smells good. They meet Gandalf and they're amazed that he is alive because up until now they thought he died in Moria. Yeah. Sam and Frodo have been out of the loop for a while. Yeah, they've been separated for quite some time. <laughs> they didn't even know Boromir was dead till like a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, things are pretty dramatic. So they take a lot of time to kind of soak in that moment. They take a lot of joy in each other's company. Yeah. They laugh a lot, almost uncontrollably. Yeah. And a lot of people think that, that, that the part in that movie, in the movie where they all meet each other again is kind of corny. Oh, like Frodo they, wakes up and like, and everyone just laughs. <laughs> but it's like, I don't know. They do it in the book. It says they laugh. Like Gandalf, it says, uh, Pippin at one point says Gandalf laughs more than he talks now. Oh, really? Yeah. Imagine that. But uh, after they're laughing, Gandalf tells them that they're awaited by the king. And Sam is really flustered because he's that kind of guy and he's like, oh, what am I going to wear? Yeah, he's like, man, meeting the king. Oh, boy, I've never met a king before. Yeah. And Gandalf tells them that they're going to wear the clothes that they wore in Mordor. <laughs> Like, oh, what the, really? <laughs> because uh, apparently now all of their things were considered like sacred artifacts. Yeah. I hope there's just holes in the ass of their pants so <laughs> you can like, see nasty. their butt cheeks and shit. <laughs> like. So as the hobbits leave their quarters, they're met by thousands of people. They're met by people from Gondor, people of Rohan, even some Dúnedain from the Northern Kingdom. Yeah. And all those people from Southern Gondor that Aragorn brought up. That, yeah, that yeah. They came up. And uh, yeah, and they sing in many different tongues. And they say, praise them with great praise. And then they're finally brought before the king. And he is a a tall man wearing no helm. And he's sitting on a throne with a naked sword on his knees. And then Sam is completely floored when he realizes that the king is in fact their good friend Aragorn himself. Yeah. And Sam calls him Strider. We have a quick excerpt from this moment as well. Yes, Sam. Strider, said Aragorn, it is a long way, is it not, from Bree, where you did not like the look of me. A long way for all of us, but yours has been the darkest road. And after that, Aragorn then does some super wild shit. He gets up and he places Sam and Frodo on the friggin' throne. On his own throne. And we actually have a quick excerpt about that as well. And then, to Sam's surprise and utter confusion, he bowed his knee before them. And taking them by the hand, Frodo on his right and Sam on his left, he led them up to the throne. And setting them upon it, he turned to the men and the captains who stood by and spoke that, so that his voice rang over all the host, crying, Praise them with great praise. What a moment. Yeah, this is a really cool part of the book. 
Isn't this when the the tree is flowering too? The white tree is flowering in the courtyard again? No, that, I think that's after the coronation. Oh, excuse me. But Sam and Frodo, they meet up with Pippin and Merry and Legolas and Gimli again. Yay! Yeah, and Sam is straight up amazed at how tall Pippin and Merry are. Yeah, he actually, when he sees them, he's like, what are those young boys doing in the service of the king? <laughs> They would take a moment to have them like stand back to back so we yeah. can compare everything. Yeah, hobbits are always kind of obsessed with how tall they are because they're all like within like three inches of each other. Right. It's from like three foot three to like three foot nine. Like it's. And Mary and Pepin's height changed when they were went through uh, the ant water when they when they drank the ant water. Yeah. yeah. So the company spends a while in Athelion, and then they uh, travel to Osgiliath, and this is when Frodo and Sam go to Osgiliath for one day. Oh, so they do go there afterwards. After the war. After everything. Okay. They stay there for one day <laughs> <laughs> and then they head back to Minas Tirith because it's like right you know it's like a you know an afternoon's gallop from Othgiliath to, to Minas Tirith right right they're they're very close to each other so the hobbits stay in Minas Tirith for some time and they attend the coronation of Aragorn as King Elisar and Frodo actually carries the crown for the coronation oh look at that and that's when the tree's flowering that's the moment I'm that's the of. moment the tree's flowering yep so let's talk about the road home because eventually Everybody's got to go home. And the fi- the hobbits do finally head home. And uh, they journey through Rohan and past Isengard and up to Rivendell. They stay in Rivendell for a while and celebrate Bilbo's birthday, go and say hello. And then they journey to Bree and bring news of the coming king. Gandalf says goodbye to them further down the road and the hobbits go ahead and return to the Shire alone. Yeah. I love that part in Bree when uh, Gandalf tells Butterbur that the king is Strider. Yeah, he's like, what? <laughs> he's, like, he's like, there's a new king is there. He's like, yeah, you know him, dude. Strider. That dude that yeah, was hanging out like here. he's like completely baffled. So the, yeah, the hobbits return to the Shire without Gandalf, without anybody, just hobbits. And uh, when they do arrive back in the shower, the Shire... The shower. They all they get in probably, the shower. They probably go. would like to take a shower. Yeah, they'll take a shower after all that. But, but the company... There's no showers to be found. No showers. Only baths. The only... <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to get at the fact that the Shire was fucked up. Oh, but yeah. I mean... I was just saying... Because I don't the think shire, showers were invented in Middle Maybe Earth. they don't take showers in the Shire. Maybe it's just baths. You're probably, probably right. You're probably right. Yeah. You know. All right. <laughs> we'll look into that. I don't know what Hobbit technology is like. <laughs> so when the company returns to the Shire, they find that everything is fucked up and super sucks now. Yeah, the Shire is completely overrun by ruffians. And we're talking men, adult yeah. men. So they're huge compared to the hobbits. Mm-hmm. And there's not like all that many of them, but they're really cruel and they... They're big. Yeah, and they're big. But uh, there's a violent struggle to overthrow them, and this is called the Scouring of the Shire. And Sam was hugely instrumental in organizing and leading hobbits in battle. Unfortunately, we're not going to really get into that right now. Why? Why why is that? Why is that? Why is that? Well, maybe there's an episode coming up about it. Maybe we're just lazy. Hmm. What do you guys think? Hmm. Hit us up on Twitter. (laughs) Is that something you want to (laughs) hear? Yeah. We're going to have like 30,000 people telling us we're lazy. (laughs) (laughs) Sound just like my mother. But yeah, we'll cover that in more detail in the future. But ultimately, after the scouring, Sam sets to work making the gardens beautiful again. Because uh, the Shire was totally fucked up and destroyed. Yeah, just totally, totally uh, exploited for everything it was worth. Yeah, all the gardens trampled. So he starts replanting things. He plants all the trees and flowers. And uh, he puts some of the soil from his box into the dirt that Galadriel gave him. Mm -hmm. And then he also plants the Malorn tree in the center of town, replacing the party tree like we mentioned earlier. And Sam's work uh, eventually pays off, and the Shire is super beautiful again, but it's just not what it used to be. And there's really no way of going back to that. And uh, to me, this is like uh, part of Tolkien's idea that evil corrupts everything that's ever cool, and it was never as good as it will be before it was touched by evil. Right, even the Shire wasn't untouchable. Mm Mm-hmm. The whole time they're building up, you know, coming home to the Shire, and then they come home, and turns out the Shire is fucked beyond repair. Yeah. And, like, they can try to repair it to some kind of a new standard, but it'll never be what it was. Never be the same. Which is very sad. Super but that's, sad. But that's just Which, one uh, of the effects of, I think, war is what he's getting at. Yeah, what war in general. And that's why me and Joel think The Lord of the Rings is darker, the book is a lot darker than the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, just that whole change in ending, mm-hmm. is it gives it a completely different tone. Mm-hmm. Maybe we'll talk about that soon. Who knows? Uh, so on May 1st, 3020, Sam actually marries Rosie Cotton. Look at that. Yeah, and they move into Bag End together to live with Frodo. Yeah. They will eventually go on to have 13 children. Holy shit. <laughs> but Frodo is only present for the their firstborn, Eleanor. 
Frodo spends much of his time ill and in pain from the wounds he sustained during the during the war. Uh, most notably, the his his chest wound acts up now and again that he got from the uh, Nazgul. Yeah, it it hurts like uh, on the anniversary of uh, mm-hmm. of Weathertop. Frodo's Especially. like, yeah, but yeah, Frodo uh, uh, at this point he also entrusts the book that he and Bilbo had been writing. Yeah, it's the Red Book, right? The Red Book, right? And uh, so that was there and back again. A Hobbit's Tale by Bilbo Baggins was the first part, and the second part that Frodo wrote was called "The Downfall of the Lord of the Rings and the Return of the King." Nice. And uh, Sam and Frodo would uh, set out on what would be their last adventure. Sam didn't know that at first. Sam does not know that. <laughs> uh, Frodo tells him that they're about to set off for, quote, Rivendell. <laughs> yeah, we're going to go up to Rivendell for the weekend. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like when you're trying to take your dog to the vet or something. <laughs> yeah, to be put to sleep, yeah. <laughs> God. Yeah, so basically they head out to the road to Rivendell, and on the road they meet up with Bilbo, Galadriel, and Elrond. And our friend Gildor's with them, too. And uh, at this point, Sam learns that they're not going to Rivendell at all. <laughs> <laughs> but, but <laughs> they're actually going to the vet. <laughs> no. He finds out that they're actually going to the Havens. They're, they're going west. They're going to the Havens. Yeah, so they're actually going to the Havens. And uh, they say that Gandalf's going to meet him there because he's uh, kicking it with his old friend, Kyrdan. Hell yeah. I mean, if there's anyone you, you want to spend time with before you leave Middle Earth, it's probably Kyrdan. Yeah. And uh, Frodo and the other ring bearers are to cross the sea and never return. And then we got a little excerpt about that. But, said Sam, and tears started in his eyes, I thought you were going to enjoy the Shire, too, for years and years to come after all you've done. So I thought, too, once. But I've been too deeply hurt, Sam. I tried to save the Shire, and it has been saved, but not for me. It must often be so, Sam, when things are in danger. Someone has to give them up, lose them, so that others may keep them. Yeah. I think that pretty much sums up that point we were trying to make. Yeah. About about uh Tolkien and yeah. the result of war affecting everything. Yeah, and then, yeah, like that once, sums that up pretty well. Yeah. Once that shit touches you, it's you're never the same. Mm-hmm. So when they reach the havens, they're greeted by none other than Kyrdan, the motherfucking ship right. Burr, 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 burr. And then they meet up with Gandalf, who is hanging out with Kyrdan. And now Gandalf is actually openly wearing his ring of power, Narya. Which is the Red Ring. Indeed. Yeah, up until now, nobody knew that he had it other than Kyrdan. Yeah. Who but now now he's just openly flashing it, flashing his bling around. Why not? But uh, they're also surprised because who gallops up but Pippin and Merry. Yeah, they found out that Merry and Pippin followed him. Yeah, and they've come to see Frodo off and accompany Sam back to the Shire. Because Gandalf kind of was like, hey. You're going to want to. You're going to want to come to the Haven. You're going to want to give Sam some company on yeah. the way back. Like friends. Like friends do. That's like that friends was, because why That was Joel? a real friend move. Because why, Joel? Friendship is magic. <laughs> I was trying to think of <laughs> what I was going to say. Little, what little catchphrases. I had, I had my magic. hands over my head like like the imagination. Yeah, thing. like the SpongeBob imagination. <laughs> yeah. Friendship is magic. And then Gandalf drops my favorite quote of his of all time. Mm. And here it is. Well, here at last, dear friends... On the shores of the sea comes an end to our fellowship in Middle Earth. Go in peace. I will not say do not weep, for not all tears are an evil. I love that line. Yeah, it's pretty great. I love it too. This is when Co- uh, Frodo kisses each of his friends, Sam last of all, and then he boards the ship and leaves to go west. And the remaining hobbits stand well into the night staring at the sea before they decide to head home. Yeah, they don't say anything to each other until they reach the Shire. It's a pretty solemn journey. Mm -hmm. And that's how you know that you're really good friends with somebody. Yeah, there's still that comfort and friendship. Yeah, like even though you're not talking, like they're still there, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, it it would have been much better for them to be there than to not. To not be there, yeah. yeah. It's it's the comfort of that friendship. I like that um, that scene in the extended edition that they do that kind of shows the post-war Hobbits. Mm-hmm. When they're sitting at the Green Dragon and everybody's dancing and having a good time. Yeah, and, and they're, they're just sitting, sitting there drinking. There. Yeah. <laughs> and they just kind of look at each other like, oh, the shit we've seen, guys. Mm-hmm. The shit we've seen. Let's have a pint. <laughs> like that's. Oh, isn't that also when they throw in Sam proposing to Rosie? To scene? Rosie, yeah. Yeah. Kill two birds with one stone. That was a good scene. I liked that scene. I liked that a lot, yeah. too. Yeah, that's kind of like... I, if they would have ended the movie with that scene, I would have been like... <laughs> yeah, that would have been, cool, yeah. been a cool ending. Yeah. But ultimately, after the Havens, Sam returns to Bag End, where he's meted by Rosie. She places their daughter in his lap, 
and Sam utters that memorable final line of Lord of the Rings. Well, I'm back. So let's talk a little bit about Sam in the Fourth Age. Not a whole lot of info, but there's some. So Sam went on to have 13 children, as we said before. A lot of kids. A lot of kids. We're going to go through them fast, so here we go. Lightning round. Okay. Eleanor the Fair. Frodo. Rose. Mary. Pippin. Goldilocks. Hamfast. Daisy. Primrose. Bilbo. Ruby. Robin. And Talmud. I love that Bilbo got a, yeah. got a kid named after him. Yeah. And then uh, Talmud is named after Rosie's dad. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Talmud Cotton. So, uh, like we had mentioned earlier in the episode, Sam, this is when Sam goes on to be mayor of the Shire from uh, Fourth Age, or he starts in Fourth Age Year 6, and he served seven consecutive terms. Depending on how long Hobbit terms are. Yeah, I'm not sure what a Hobbit term is. I wanted to translate that into years, but I'm not sure. He's a dictator, dude. Seven (laughs) years? What if their terms are like senators, like six years? Six years times seven over? It, turn, it turns out that that vision he had in Mordor came true. Yeah. And then they show like Sam just sitting on, like on the in the brick <laughs> building. <laughs> yeah. And sadly, Rosie Cotton, the love of Sam's life, the wife of his 13 children, she dies in fourth age 61. And at this point, Sam entrusts the Red Book to his eldest daughter, Eleanor, and sets off for the Grey Havens finally. And this is when Sam finally sails across the sea to be with his best friend, Frodo. Friendship is magic. And we're pretty sure he sails across with Círdan, right? Because this is when Círdan goes, we think. Yeah, because Círdan, he was I think the that's last. when he finally leaves. He's the last elf to leave. So, mm-hmm. like, I don't know how long it took him to clear out. Right. <laughs> but, but, but I assume Círdan's as long last. as people are sailing west, he's going to be sailing west. And the last time we specifically hear of someone sailing west, it's Sam, so we think. Yeah, and Sam is also, uh, Círdan's also a ring bearer, so they, oh, yeah. there might be the two last ring bearers. Last maybe. two ring bearers. That would make sense. It would make sense. That would be a real cool boat ride. Yeah, I'd love that. But that's ultimately what we've got for Sam, guys. Yeah, yeah. So what did we learn in today's episode? Let's go through it. We started about Sam's simple origins in the Shire. We learned about uh, what it was like for Sam as a child. We learned uh, the many roles uh, as Frodo's friend and faithful servant that Sam had done. We learned about Sam's many contributions to their journeys. We learned about Sam's role as a member of the Fellowship. We learned about Sam following Frodo to Mordor alone. We learned about Sam's badassery in Mordor and on the way there. And then we learned about Sam's life after the War of the Ring. And most importantly of all, children, what did we learn today? Friendship is magic. That was really good. That was good. What the fuck, man? That, that was, was yeah, completely unplanned. That was completely unplanned. I hope you guys are proud of us. I hope you're proud. <laughs> <laughs> but that's uh, that's that's it for this, guys. It's been a really long one, but it's a special episode. So uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks for hanging out with us, and thanks for being patient with us over that hiatus as well. Um, we just like we had mentioned earlier, we want to make sure we're able to bring you guys the best content that we can. Yeah. And this whole podcast is a learning experience for for both of us. And we'll be updating you more uh, soon uh, soon on uh, the changes we made with our season structure. Um, And then we also want to take time out to say thanks for giving to the Patreon, guys. Yeah, we really appreciate everything you guys do for us on Patreon. That does help out quite a bit. Uh, A lot, actually. (laughs) Yeah. 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 At this point, this this, this whole podcast for us at this point is still, it's a a hobby. You know, it's something that we work and pay to continue to do. Yeah. Um, The Patreon definitely helps us curve those bills. So we oh, yeah. appreciate any and all help. Uh, yeah. And if you uh, if you do plan on donating to the uh, GoFundMe for our friends Katie and Joe, which this episode is dedicated to, um, thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Like, seriously. Um, every dollar helps. And we will consider it a personal favor. If you if you love Keep on Tolkien, especially if you were thinking about, like, yeah. I don't, I don't want to, like, turn you away from the Patreon. But, like, if you're thinking about, like, I want to give these guys a little bit of money, maybe throw some Katie and Joe's way. Yeah, that's, yeah, it was kind of part of the point of this episode. If at any point you'd feel like supporting or contributing to Keep on Tolkien, we'd appreciate that if you'd send that money over to our friend's GoFundMe page. Yeah, that would be great. And always remember, guys, friendship is magic. Like seriously, like go go find your best friend and give them a hug and tell you how much you love them. Um, Joel being my second best friend of, I mean, like I have two best friends is what I mean. Oh, I now. oh I see. <laughs> oh, I see now. Well, you're like my like, I don't know. It's I've complicated. No, it's, I, I'm blessed with two best friends, but yeah, so I'm gonna, I, I'm, uh, well, I'm in the same boat as yeah. you. I don't I don't think you have to put labels on. Yeah, exa- exactly. One but or two best friends. I will be hugging Joel after this episode. Until well, it'll be a and, it'll be a sweaty hug. We've it's, been in this small room for a while. <laughs> I was just gonna say it'll be sweaty as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, because you never know when some shit is gonna happen, guys. Hold people you love. Tell the people you love you love them. 
and all that. Yeah. Um, Never know what you got till it's gone. Never know what you got till it's gone. Is that a White Snake song that you just quoted? Some hair metal band. Anyway, that's all for us today. <laughs> Another lost pop culture reference <laughs> to end the show. Thank you so much for listening, guys. We had a hell of a time. This was a really fun episode. We're glad we're back. It's fun being back. It's fun being back. And uh, as always, I am and will have continued to be Danny J. I'm just Jolen. And this is a special sign-off for Joe and Katie. As we know, I do it every day, but I mean, it's like my motto now. But uh, here it goes. Aure in Tuluba. And that means they shall come again, guys. Love you. Bye.